Good morning and welcome to our service of worship with Covenant Presbyterian Church here in Atlanta. We're grateful to have you worth worshiping with us near and far. My name is Kate Calusi Estes and I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Here in the sanctuary with us are our singers and bell ringers, my colleague Richard Hill, our music director Jeffrey McIntyre, and our liturgist Kathy Lansbury. Today we started a new Sunday School opportunity on faith and politics, holy disunity, using the book by the Reverend Leighton Williams. It's led by Will Simpson and Carson Meredith. They'll meet for the next five weeks at 9.30 in the morning. If you're interested, you can register using the link in the e-blast this week. Um, and just follow us, and we look forward to join you joining us. If you're interested in the book, don't hesitate to email me. Also, this afternoon at 1 o'clock, we'll have our town hall about our HVAC and other capital projects facing the congregation. We'll meet at 1 p.m. on Zoom, and you can still register and join that meeting right up until it begins. So we hope you'll join us there. Next week at 1 p.m., we'll have a Q&A with follow-up questions. Also via the Zoom, using the same link, both are in the, e it's all in the e-blast. Today is Pride Sunday in Atlanta, and although there's no parade or festival, which actually is probably lucky because they would be sopping wet, um, our choir is representing by wearing different color scapulars. Richard and I are wearing our most colorful um, stoles, and we hope that you are celebrating wherever you are, knowing that God loves each and every one of us, and we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Since you're joining us via Facebook Live, because our YouTube feed is not working today, we invite you to join us and let us know that you're worshiping with us, and then share the stream on your page so your friends can join us too. Our new youth director, Lauren, and one of our youth are managing chat, so if you have um, prayer concerns to add in there, that would be great. And share our service and join together with us. And now, our call to worship. lost in the busyness of life, and we forget who we are and whose we are. So I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession 
as we remember and confess our shortcomings and our sin. Gracious Lord, we are precious in your sight, yet we often forget that we are your beloved. We confess that our love is fickle and inconsistent. We follow selfish goals and deny our way of life harms others and hurts your world. Have mercy on us. We want to change. Create in us a clean heart. Strengthen our resolve. Reconcile us to one another and bless us with your peace. Hear us as we continue to confess in silence. of God's amazing love is this. While we turn away and ignore God, we are still precious and beloved in God's sight. And God loves us and forgives us. So know that you are forgiven and be at peace. And now that we have found peace in forgiveness and reconciliation to God, we share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. So from our reading today from the Old Testament is from Psalm 139, verses 7 through 14. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you 
for I am fearfully and wonderfully awake. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. And here also the New Testament that comes from the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter, verses 21 and 22. Luke's version of Jesus' baptism. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. As I preach this morning, keep it in context of Pride Week, as well as the happenings in the Black Lives Matters movement, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about as we look to the scripture and Henry Nouwen's uh, uh, guidance and inspiration for this. I opened up Henry Nouwen's book, uh, Spiritual Direction, Wisdom on the Long Walk of Faith, on which I'm basing uh, and inspired for this series of sermons, and I found a postcard from about 12 years ago. It was sent to me when I left the church I loved and ventured out onto uh, uh, an endeavor in the business world, similar to what I'm doing now. And it came from Ed Loring. Ed is my Presbyterian minister friend. Ed is, uh, was one of the most outspoken advocates for the poor and the homeless in our city. At the open door, I used to hang out there, uh, much like Bill Roberts here in our congregation. He sent me a postcard, and it simply said, uh, Dear Richard, how are you? Who are you now? What are you going to do? Love Ed. Who are you now? I kept that. Treasure it. Henry Nouwen says that is the basic question that keeps resurfacing in all of our lives. Uh, And he says it it resurfaces throughout at different times. And he tells this story in the beginning of a chapter, uh, a story from the Talmud of a rabbi and the fugitive. Uh, One day, a young fugitive, a boy, was... Uh, trying to hide himself from the enemy and he came into this small village and the people there uh, welcomed him were kind to him and offered him a place to stay but when the soldiers who sought the fugitive uh, found that he must be hiding there uh, everyone became fearful and the soldiers threatened to burn the village and kill everyone in the village unless they told him uh, where the boy was The people went to the rabbi and uh, asked him what to do. The soldiers said, by morning you must give me an answer. Uh, Torn between handing the boy over to the enemy and having his people killed, the rabbi withdrew uh, to read his Bible, hoping to find an answer before dawn. And in the early morning, his eyes fell upon these words. It is better that one man dies than that the whole people be lost. Then the rabbi closed the Bible, called the soldiers, told them where the boy was hidden, and after the soldiers led the uh, fugitive away to be killed, there was a feast in the village because the rabbi had saved all the people's lives, but the rabbi did not go to the feast. Uh, Overcome with a deep sadness, uh, he remained in his room, And that night an angel came to him and asked, What have you done? He said, I handed the fugitive over to the enemy. And then the angel said, But don't you know that you just handed over the Messiah? How could I know? The rabbi said anxiously. 
And then the angel said, if instead of reading your Bible, you had visited the young man just once and looked into his eyes, you would have known. Are we not challenged in our daily life now and says to look deeper into the eyes of the people we encounter, uh, even those who are running away from something and see in them the face of God? So we turn to our scripture this morning and as Jesus is baptized, the voice opens from the heavens saying, uh, you are my child, the beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Now sure, anyone hearing that and anyone seeing Jesus would have known for sure. We would have known for sure, right? That's the Messiah, the anointed one of God. But how could someone today recognize a random person in a crowd as being the Messiah or the Son of God. If you look more closely at this story of Jesus' baptism in the Gospel of Luke, as compared to the Gospels of Matthew or Mark and John, we notice some differences of the context here that Luke specifically is trying to make some points. It says, when... Jesus also had been baptized. And that's all we get about his baptism. There's no narrative. John the Baptist doesn't say anything. Jesus doesn't say anything. There's no, no elaborate uh, narrative of the actual water going on his head. It's that partial verse is all we get of his baptism. In fact, it opens up and says, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus went and was also baptized. Now when all the people were baptized... This crowd gathered. Jesus was just one among the crowd. Luke identifies Jesus with just the common people. He identifies Jesus as one of the crowd. John does not point him out. John doesn't point him out as the one that he said, there's one coming after me of, of whose uh, sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. In the Gospel of Luke, John does not point Jesus out as the one coming after him. Jesus is just part of the crowd. So uh, we know that we assume we would notice it was Jesus in the midst of the crowd. But with the story of the rabbi and the enemy and the, and the fugitive, uh, he didn't recognize what the angel said was the Messiah. Would we miss it as well? So how does Luke help us here? Uh, immediately following this passage is a passage of Jesus' genealogy. You get a different genealogy, a somewhat different genealogy. In Matthew, Luke gives a genealogy, and I'll, I'll be honest, that's the part I just kind of skip over uh, because it says Jesus was the son, so it was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli, who was, and then goes on and on. And then... I read it this time, and then it comes to, uh, and uh, Jesus in that list was the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Boaz, I recognize those, and then it goes on with names I don't recognize for generations. Then it says, and the son of Shem, and the son of, son of Noah, recognize that. And then goes on to other names, and then the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, yes, it's tracing his family tree back to Abraham. Uh, he is a good uh, Jewish man, boy, man. But then it keeps going. Names I haven't heard of, although it comes to uh, the son of Methuselah and the son of Enoch. Okay, yeah, I sort of remember them. Uh, and then keeps going. And then the son of Seth and the son of Adam and the son of God. Jesus is traced back not just to his Abrahamic roots, but all the way back to Adam that Jesus, Luke is saying, represents all of humanity. And even beyond that, Jesus represents God as the one anointed as the Messiah. So Jesus is the representative of humanity and God. Uh, that's pretty obvious in the book of Luke. Uh, but going back to the rabbi and the fugitive, 
how does this help? Uh, how could he recognize, how was he supposed to recognize that that fugitive was the Messiah? But if you think about this passage, then we could trace our lineage as well. I'll, I'll use mine for example. Uh, Richard, the son, so it is thought of Bill. I think it's true, but who knows? Uh, who was the son of, of Grady? Who was the son of, and it goes on and on and on. If you go back far enough, it will be, and the son of Noah, because the world in our story of creation uh, and, and redemption uh, started back over with Noah, and then it goes back on to where Richard, the son of Adam, and according to Luke, the son of God. Luke is making a point of uh, the, the humanity of us, but that the creator created each of us out of love. So why is it not that that statement of Jesus' baptism is only made for Jesus, only made for one who is sinless, and oh, there's no way that God could look upon me or look upon you and and have those same words, it's reserved only for Jesus. But if you trace your lineage back to Adam and trace it back to God being created by a God who loves, that same statement made to Jesus can be made to each one of us. And that's uh, one of the biggest points that Henry Nouwen uh, really makes that, uh, that we have lost sight of. Uh, we are the beloved. We are loved by God, made in love, a son or a daughter of God, simply because God made us, not that we prove anything. Now it says the greatest trap in life today is not success or popularity or power for which Jesus was tested in the wilderness. The greatest trap is self-rejection, doubting who we truly are, when we come to believe the voices that call us to be unworthy and unlovable, then success, popularity, and power are easily perceived as attractive solutions upon which to draw our own identity. But now it says being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. We are loved as creatures with both limitations and glory. But we refuse to hear or doubt those same words God made to Jesus could and would be said about each of us. This is my child, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Self-doubt comes in. And it, it comes in not just rejecting that the beloved could be a statement God makes about me. It, it comes in from a temptation of compulsiveness as well. Now and says, aren't you, like me, hoping that some person or some event or some thing uh, will come along and, and give us that final uh, feeling of inner well-being that we so seek and desire? And to be honest, that's one of the reasons I love going on mission trips. Uh, seeking a sense of well-being, I, uh, I feel more worthy in the eyes of God that God could say, well done, good and faithful servant, if I'm going out and serving the least of these, which is something that pleases God. But that's not what makes it where I can claim to be the beloved. One of my mentors, uh, Tim Dearborn, he's a Presbyterian minister. He's, he was uh, Steve Hayner's best friend, the president of Columbia Seminary. Uh, Tim Dearborn uh, wrote in one of his books that he had become a mission-holic and he was deriving his identity from his mission work and taking pride in that and it was eclipsing his sense of being the beloved just for being created by God out of love. So do you find that you fall to the temptation of compulsiveness uh, that some person, some book, some class, some trip, some mission, or uh, something would bring you that inner, inner peace that you seek rather than relying just on the identity that God gives you. Uh, we're tempted to forget 
that Scripture says, God says to us, I have called you by name and you are mine. God tries to remind us of that. That's what our baptism is all about. But it, as soon as we claim, I am the beloved, then we're faced with uh, the call to become who we truly are made to be, to be loved and to become the beloved together. And that's where St. Augustine described it as, uh, my soul is restless until I find my rest in you, O God. So the challenge is to avoid the temptation of forgetting I'm God's beloved and to vo avoid the temptation of a compulsiveness to, to seek it, to find it. Now in claims, becoming the beloved means letting the truth of our belovedness become enfleshed in everything we think and say and do. It entails a long and painful process of appropriation or, or rather incarnation. And this process requires a regular practice of prayer, a daily discipline or a constancy of prayer. So when we go back to the original story of the rabbi and the fugitive, how was the rabbi supposed to know that the fugitive was the Messiah? How are we supposed to know? Because you are a child of God. You are the beloved with whom God is well pleased. I am the beloved. Uh, that fugitive is the beloved. The child of God. The one anointed by God. That's how we're to know. So we have a simple exercise that I leave you with. I hope that you will start each day in meditation. Uh, it's not so much a, a time of prayer, but can you take five minutes in quietness and have a mantra? I am your beloved. I am your beloved. I am your beloved. And at some point then transition. We are your beloved. We are your beloved. Try five minutes. Work on up to 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And you might just start believing who you are that you are uh, the child of God, the beloved, with whom God is well pleased. And then, as Nowen says, are we not challenged, even in these corona times of face masks, even in these times uh, where uh, some still aren't granted pride, uh, even in these times of Black Lives Matter, are we not challenge to look deeper into the eyes of the people we encountered and even those who are running away from something to see in them the face of God to be loved and to see the beloved in everyone
Remembering our belovedness, let us pray to the one who is love. God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, you are the one who calls us to worship, and we give you thanks for the opportunity to respond to your call. We praise you, O God, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We hold on to this claim as we recognize our humanity, reminding ourselves that we are complex creatures with complex lives. Today, we recognize Pride Sunday in Atlanta, and we thank you for creating us with all of our different identities, and we pray for the day when all people will feel seen, affirmed, and loved. O oh God, we pray for your people as this pandemic continues to influence all of our lives. We thank you for the doctors and the nurses, the scientists, the hospital staff, and the healthcare workers. We pray in particular for Claude Cox's daughter, Debbie Gardner, who has tested positive for COVID May Debbie experience your strength, healing, and comfort. We pray for the lives that have been lost to this pandemic and the loved ones who are grieving. May they feel your love this day and for the days to come. O oh God, we pray for all of the leaders in our world May they be reminded that their decisions influence the lives of so many others. May they be encouraged to bring your justice, your peace, and your love into this world that so desperately needs it. May they be guided by your voice and your truth in all that they say and do. O oh God, we observed World Mental Health Day yesterday. And we remember and pray for those who are made aware of their mental health every moment of every day. We pray that they will be reminded that they are loved and that they are seen as we all continue to navigate the uncertainty of this pandemic. We pray for those who have been made aware of their mental health. Help us to remember that we are created and loved by you Help us to find ways to nourish our mental health every day. Help us to support one another to the best of our abilities. O oh God, we give you thanks for your creation, the trees and the streams, the bright sunshine and the light rain. We also pray for those affected by natural forces whose lives have been changed by fire, flood, and wind. May you remind them that you are with them and sustain the communities that are impacted so that, the other, so that people can help one another. As we pray for your creation, O oh God, we remember that you created us, each of us and all of each of us. We hold in our hearts and pray today for Julia Kirk, who is in hospice care. We hold on to the hope that in life and in death, we are called and claimed beloved. We remember and give thanks for all of the pastors who have touched our lives as we recognize World Pastor Appreciation Day today. We give you thanks for the creativity and energy that they bring to the church. Today, we thank you especially for Richard and Kate. May we remember, O oh God, that although we are distant from one another, by your spirit, you connect us. By your grace, you redeem us. By your love, you never leave us. As the psalmist declares, you are the one who created us. You are the one who sustains us. You are the one who is always with us. We lift all of these prayers and the ones we hold in our hearts to you today. We also lift our voices together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. remind you to join us in about an hour at one o'clock for our informational meeting about the HVAC and other capital repairs that are impending upon us. Uh, but as you go, I want you to remember as Christians, when we were baptized, God made that claim. You are my beloved. You are my child, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. In the waters that passed over creation, we're also reminded God makes that claim for each one of God's creatures that God made. So remember, you, God says, you are my child, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. So beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. So go forth out into the world in peace. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all persons, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and remain forever. Amen. <laughs>